All right. Welcome to episode, what is it? Episode three. Um, it's a, off to a great start. I'm sitting here with a good, long, long time friend of mine, Glenn Mitchell. Uh, he's from the northeast of the country. And uh, tell us about yourself uh, for the people who don't know you. Um, yeah. Anything. <laughs> Actually, uh, let's start like where you're from. Um, and then what prompted you to go into the military and when, what time frame was that? Uh, right now living in, uh, Massachusetts as, as you mentioned, the Northeast area, but I've lived pretty much almost everywhere, traveled most of my life and, uh, you know, career wise. And, uh, as a kid, um, I joined the military in, uh, 1997. Um, I was a college student. And I was broke <laughs> and at the time I, I was working, but, uh, a couple of banks were changing around and they lost like four of my checks. And that really sucks when you're paying your own bills and have no food and can barely afford your rent, even though you've been working 40 hours a week, I eventually I covered the checks, but, uh, I was, uh, I was hurting and, um, Comedy was one of uh, one of my neighbors was National Guard and saw that I was struggling, and you know I I was food poor and he actually gave me a couple of MREs and I said you know what let me go look at this, <laughs> let me go check out this army thing, and uh, yeah uh, that that kind of pushed me to take a look what was going on, um, you know I think I needed to find my own direction and whatnot so it's a good kick in the kick in the pants to get in the the proper uh, get moving in the proper direction. <laughs> So it was the MREs that brought you into the military. I know. Isn't that sad? <laughs> I was, I was definitely poor. Um, you know, I was just, I, I just ran out of money, just waiting to get, uh, waiting for all my checks to clear at the bank. So all of a sudden, uh, you know, <laughs> you realize what's important and what's not. Yeah. Right. Food. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so let's just jump in and, um, you recently retired, correct? That would be September 1st. Yes. September 1st. So let's talk about the last um, six months of that up to that retirement point. Um, and of course, let me just preface it by saying you're coming from the Army Reserve side of full TPU, not AGR or anything like that. So you're a yep. reservist, reservist, pure reservist, Title 32 still, right? Something, Something like that. <laughs> so yeah, what did that last uh, that last six months look like as far as the processes, the things you had to do, like the paperwork? Like what was that? What did that entail? So it's a it's a nine month process. Um, it's uh, not an easy process, and it uh, kind of leaves you hanging because they really don't tell you if the process is going well or not. Um, so you fill out the retirement packet, then every once in a while they request some random more information for you to fill out. Uh, then obviously you have to get counseled to make sure that, you know, you want to retire, which I definitely did. Um, but what, you know, I just kept working and doing my job and not having any clue as to where it was in the retirement process. And then less than two weeks before September 1st, I got, i uh, just, I lit I, I actually had a dream that I retired. So I'm like, you know what, maybe I should go check my email. And sure enough, there in my email that day was uh, the retirement orders. And it was, um, it was less than two weeks notice. And that made it rather difficult simply because I didn't even have a drill in between them. So I was literally calling up command like, hey, I'm not gonna be at this week, uh, the weekend's drill. Okay, when will you be back? Uh, never, I'm uh, <laughs> not in the army anymore apparently. So it was, uh, it was a little bit of a shock just because it felt like there was no notice. Um, I mean, you knew it was coming, but there was no way to check to see if, well, it's the army. You, we've all done that paperwork and somebody screws up something somewhere. So there was like no checks and balances. They just said, yep, brigade has it. That's brigade has or HRC has, it. that's all I would hear. Not, is it going well? Did I miss something? I don't know. That was, so that was, that was a little chaotic. And, um, uh, it was, I had made that decision basically after the last deployment. So hit my 25 year mark. I was like, yeah, I think I'm good. <laughs> yeah. So 
in that whole thing. Yeah. Like I agree with you. There's not a lot of good feedback when it comes to, nope. um, when it comes to the retirement process and, and many other things in military life. Right. Um, you just don't get this that. This had to be the least amount of feedback I've ever gotten for anything military. It yeah. did feel like it took longer to ret retire paperwork wise than join. Right. <laughs> you think it'd be the other way around. <laughs> yeah, like, Get out. Nope. Nope. So I, I, I was surprised at the amount of paperwork it took. Yeah. Yeah. So in that, in that last, um, nine months or so, was there anything specific that stood out, um, that you experienced that maybe triggered like a really high level of anxiety or stress or, or maybe the opposite, like something that triggered a, a complete sense of joy or like, well, I know that sense of joy is on September 1st. <laughs> um, but the, <laughs> the stress side is pay attention. Um, I think I was lucky as, uh, being in, in a leadership role. Uh, I was on a lot of leadership meetings and in some of those meetings, I would literally hear, uh, them bring up the retirement packet and actually state that, um, you know, they're, they're waiting on data from, from me for the retirement packet. And thank God I was on those meetings. Cause I said, Hey, I'm on this meeting. What data are you waiting for? Well, we're waiting for this form. I said, well, I checked my mail and you haven't sent it to me. Well, yeah, we still have to send it to you. I said, then it's not pending me. It's, it's pending you. And that did happen a couple of times. And I did call them out in, you know, meetings with battalion brigade. So I was on the call. So it was a leadership call. I was like, uh, don't, uh, don't call me out for not doing something when it's you that's actually not doing it. Oh, we're waiting on this packet. I'm like, ah, I sent that to you. Oh, that's not what I meant. Well, that's what you just told the brigade commander. I'm right here. <laughs> yeah, no, they, well, obviously it's all on phone calls, but it was hilarious to me because I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm on the call. I'm not sure if you noticed. <laughs> that's so insane. Definitely called out a couple people in that process. Um, one of the odd things that happened was the day I submitted it was because I, somebody definitely annoyed me. So I don't want to call out names or anything. Uh, I was told they may be voluntold to do something. And I was like, I just got back from mobilization. You can't voluntold me to do something. Um, I'm like, well, we may have to. I said, all right, cool. I hung up the phone. I literally typed up my, finalized my retirement paperwork and, and emailed it within 15 minutes of the phone call. It's like, all right, we'll play that game. But, um, uh, the army in their infinite wisdom, uh, somebody was apparently working on the, um, cloud email boxes and apparently deleted 13,000 cloud email instances. So my retirement packet actually got deleted. Um, it wasn't in my sent folder or anything anymore. I had to actually resend it. I was wondering why nobody responded. <laughs> I was like, somebody would have responded when I said, I'm done. And they're like. I got no responses. And I go, went and looked at my scent and it was absolutely gone. They had actually deleted the S1's mailbox. Wow. And in deleting the instance, deleted everything that was sent to it. That's insane. <laughs> so pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> Technology, it matters. <laughs> so September 1st, uh, we're into the middle of October almost. Um, does it feel any different or the, is it, is it, I mean, I know it's a relief to be out and I know it's probably yeah. a little bit short time to, to ask this question, but, um, you know, some people get out and then a year later, two years later, they start to feel that, that missing the camaraderie, missing the, the structure, even though it's chaotic structure, um, there's a lot of structure in the military that you don't get on the outside world. And I know you experienced that firsthand because you, you've been working in the outside world alongside of the military. So, um, but anything that, uh, that feels different or, uh, now that you're retired, I, I would say kind of where I'll get, I know I'll get to the point of missing the camaraderie, missing, missing the people. But since I have people close by, we've already, you know, tried to build something outside of the military to help us out with that. I think I'll be good. Um, I, you know, I think the biggest things that I'll miss is, uh, feeling the feeling of contribution of uh, making that difference. And, um, I guess being in the know, maybe Does that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. I, I was, I was holding onto my ID card for dear life for like a month or two after like 
while I was on, uh, I guess it was right after I got off of, uh, my, my end leave. And I was like, man, if I turn this in, I'm never going to be able to check my email again. Like, you know, I had that like moment with myself. Uh, I, I planned ahead. I made sure I, uh, turned in all my equipment before, and I will say I was pleasantly surprised to be a first time go at the CIA. Um, for all my TA-50, I was missing one thing, but what was hilarious was the last time I had used it was at the range for the unit, and I'd been looking for it ever since, and uh, it was a bag, and they apparently had an extra one at the unit. I'm like, I swear that was mine. <laughs> so I had a couple extra things, and, you know, uh, working with good people, they kind of do a quick trade-off, like, all right, we got an extra one of these, you got an extra one of those, maybe that's the issue, we'll close it out. Uh, I kept on, I, I held on to some stuff, they are like, Oh, you won't have to turn it in. Like, still keep showing up with my CIF, so I'm not playing that game. I don't want to get the bill. Did you Did you do it locally at the unit, or did you have to go to like um, somewhere else to do it at some active duty base? Just at the unit. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah, because I hear different stories, and maybe it's AGRs have to go to an active duty base or something like that. Uh, I have no idea. Yeah, you AGR I'm, people are weird. Yeah, we're weird. I had to I had to come to Fort. Gordon and do all my clearing and all that stuff. So I had to do my CIF turn in here rather than at, at oh, the unit. I'm so tired of that place. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost tired of it as well. Um, okay. Um, so, and this question kind of doesn't apply because you, again, you were working already, but if you had to give advice to somebody who was getting out and say they didn't have a job. So even a reservist who maybe didn't have a full-time job, which would be kind of weird unless they're living at home or something like that, or maybe their spouse or a significant other has a job that takes care of all the bills and they just kind of stay at home and manage the house and manage the kids and the dog. Um, are there any tips or pointers you could point somebody to job-wise for mentally preparing and also like physically actively preparing to uh transition and and move into another job outside of the military so i'd say the big thing is build up your connections uh specifically with the army um depending on what your field is you want to build up your connections in whatever field that you're working in um as uh, I do uh, computer security just making sure i have those connections so i can reach out to random people because you know, you've already known people that have retired or you've already worked with some of those people in the field for years. They should know your skill set. And that's usually the best way to try and find a job. These this day and age, I don't think I've seen anybody get uh, hired unless they knew just one random person. And it's not, you know, somebody um, helping anybody get a job. It's just having that one contact in that can help kick your resume to the right person. Because these there's a lot of places where the resumes just are going to this void and you have to harass HR to uh, try and get the get the right people in. Other than that, I would just say if you don't have a job or no plans, I would just find any job. I don't, don't care what labor style work it is. Just get something consistent so you have a schedule to fall back on. So you're kind of filling the void of going to formations and going to... I was just saying the void of time because the worst thing to do is have nothing to do and just sit on your tail. If you at least create some structure, even if you have no idea what you do, just don't, fast food, don't even care. Just stay busy. Sometimes it's not about the check. It's about the staying busy and the socialization. Yep. Yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really important. Um, while you were getting out or right before you were getting out, and I, I don't know if this applies or not, but in most cases, especially leadership positions, um, did you prepare any kind of smart book for the person who would be following in your footsteps, like, you know, battle drills or rosters or spreadsheets or any of that stuff that may help them along the way that they don't have to recreate? Technically, no. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, as, a, as a warrant, I had a bunch of warrants already working for me, working towards the same goal. So they were already involved for months with everything we were doing and in planning. So passing that off to them, I think was pretty easy. I'm sure certain, certain warrant officers right now want to kill me for putting them in charge. <laughs> so, uh, 
I mean, we pretty much did everything uh, on Teams. So most of our organization tracking spreadsheets and training and whatnot was kept up there. Is there a legacy that you wanted to leave behind after leaving the military? Like maybe something you thought about when you first came in or something that you realized along the path of your military career? And did you, were you able to leave that legacy behind or is it something that was kind of left undone or? Quick thing I learned, um, right, probably from the beginning of the military is you can't really do change just standing outside the walls and complaining and bitching. Um, you really want to affect change and just go in and do it yourself. Um, a couple of weird things I've learned in that process is um, nobody usually wants to make a decision. And sometimes if everyone's just waiting for a decision to be made, make the decision and go with it. Um, I've had a lot of times where I make a decision, throw it out there, and I'm expecting, honestly, it to be a, a brainstorming session or somebody to challenge my ideas. And they're like, oh, nope, we're going with that one. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, I think the other thing I kind of picked up as a, uh, probably from the Warren Officer Corps is um, uh, it's not, you're not the smartest person or the most needed person if you're the person that's holding on to all that information. Um, holding on to all that skill and only dabbing it out when, when need be. But I think you help people the most and help your business help the military the most is if you constantly share that information and train out to other people. Um, in the civilian side, what makes that uh, helpful is if I share the information and share my way of doing things, then I don't have to be the one to do it all the time. And that also makes it a lot easier to take a vacation and not get paged. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of harks back to the, uh, the question about the, the smart book or leaving behind some stuff when you retire. But yeah, if you're doing it along, the, along the way, I think that's essentially the same thing and it meets the same goal, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say smart book, uh, a lot of the stuff that we do, uh, builds around playbooks and scripts and whatnot. So usually keeping those up to date and, uh, I usually keep, uh, uh keep all the different types of playbooks. Um, that I've developed over the years and utilize them to build new playbooks from wherever I go and introduce people new techniques. Yeah. Plus, if I remember correctly, the, the unit is one of the few units that I've been in that actually had like this master tracker that kind of drilled down into every detail of every soldier. And then it was split off in platoons and split off in sections where, you know, all the inputted information came up to one big master tracker that had like everything on it. Right. So. Sometimes it, it felt like they reinvented the wheel a couple times. And I remember there was a, a couple of drills straight where they're like, Hey, we need all your different certifications that you have. Like, I swear I gave this to you last drill in a different spreadsheet. Yeah. Well, we need them again. And then you come to the next drill. Hey, we need all your certs. I'm like, what are you doing with the data? Where's it going? It's great to have data, but if there's no data management, then, you know, it's kind of pointless. Yeah, that's true. Collect like all the data you want. It's just piping it to DevNull. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, okay. How about retirement gifts? So I know this is like a, it seems like it's a, uh, a thing that a lot of retirees do. I didn't really give myself a retirement gift. I don't really believe in that. Um, I did fix my computer and make sure that it was updated and, you know, swapped out my old computer so that I had something good that I could work with to do my job, to do coding, to do this stuff. Um, but was there a, like an end goal retirement gift that you were looking at? Cause like some people go out and buy like a Porsche or they'll buy a house or like whatever, um, may or you may know, not apply. I don't really think so. Um, part of what I did was, uh, I had planned out the retirement and planned out something to try and fill some of the void of the retirement. And part of that was to uh, start uh, teaching at colleges. Um, well, the problem was I was told the teaching would take a lot longer for me to get certified, but apparently I knew somebody who knew somebody. So I got certified really fast and then the retirement took a lot longer. So next thing you know, I kind of sort of had three jobs and uh, yeah, that, uh, that kicked, <laughs> kicked my ass with some of the timelines. Um, what I ended up doing was, um, it, it's a combination of work, military, and you know, teaching. I ended up having building a new office 
um, and just reorganizing everything. And I've updated like a couple, couple things. So I wouldn't say I did a retirement gift, but just had to kind of set up a new area for working. Um, mainly cause I have a German shepherd that likes to annoy me when I work and, uh, he's big. So when I'm typing, he will literally pick up my hand at random points in time. So I had to build an area with a door. <laughs> and you're not a Corvette type person either way. So <laughs> not really. Maybe Mustang. Um, I, we did get the wife a new car, so she does have a new Mustang. Oh, well, there you go. You got her a retirement me. gift. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that was prior to retirement. Uh, you know, with all the chaos of COVID and whatnot, she started working again after I got home because it was just messy with me not being home. Yeah. That's great. It's really good. Did you get a chance to check out the benefits delivery at discharge? Does that even apply to reservists? I don't think so. All of a sudden they will randomly just email me tons of stuff from the VA. <laughs> okay. Cause I know I, I randomly heard about it when I was going through the process of retirement and I ended up having a place here on base. <clears throat> Excuse me. That actually well, did. I've been talking to other friends going through leaving the military. And one thing I guess the active duty does a little differently than us is uh, active duty goes through the, uh, TARP program. Is that it? Uh, TAP. TAP. Sorry. Well, they make, you know, reservists go through it every time they do more than 60 days of training. So it's absolutely obnoxious and, um, makes no sense. Um, they, uh, they force you to write, you know, answer questions like, do you have a job? Do you have a car? Do you have a house? And, uh, it's like, um, I'm in the, like, I, I think my favorite one ever, they asked, when do you plan to complete uh, your degree? And it was uh, 2015 when I answered that one. I was like, in 2008. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, well, we can help you get a better degree. I'm like, you won't help anybody get uh, more than one graduate. They're like, no, we can help you get a job. I gave them the number that I already make. And they're like, well, no, we can't do that either. Um, we can help you get certs. I'm like, I got seven last year in the military. What would you like to help me with? Well, uh, you know, so it's a little obnoxious. Um, you know, you had to prove all this silly stuff and I know it's, you know, pushed down from Congress, but just silly for the reservists. Yeah. It's a little overkill, right? I mean, even some of the things like, do you have your, your budget in order and do you have blah, blah, blah. Like, Oh, my favorite was one person actually complained because it was, uh, they were coming back from Afghanistan years ago and they made him go through a budget course in the middle of, uh, you know, the army not meeting their budget and not paying people for a certain amount of time. It's like, wait, teach me how to budget, get my paychecks delayed because your budget's messed up. Uh, not sure. Uh... Doesn't, doesn't make sense. <clears throat> Um, okay. Have you ever traveled on space a at all recently in the past? Never, not once No. plan on it. I never trust it. Really? Why? Uh, my, I usually have my timelines are so tight mm -hmm. that I need to be in a certain space at a certain time and I don't want to chance it. So you don't like the Russian roulette, like, no travel no. model. <laughs> no, I, I need my schedule because I'm usually very, uh, I am I'm, I'm usually not schedule oriented, but I'm usually just, you know, so busy doing so many things that I, if I need to be there at a certain time, I just need to be there and I don't really want to wait because it, they'll just mess with my plans and <laughs> yeah, my plans are usually short. <laughs> yeah. And not even for like a vacation or anything like that, or like checking out no. some country in Europe. No, 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 I don't trust it. <laughs> you should trust it, man. <laughs> I've been in the military way too long. Trust nothing. <laughs> yeah, good. I mean, it's, it's the air force. They're a different breed of military. So, well, uh, and sometimes after what I went through with, uh, with all the travel from this last mode, they, uh, they messed up pretty bad on a lot of things. Yeah. And that was more than just army. That was just government. No. Yeah. They don't always get it a hundred percent right, but they're, they're damn good at what they do for the most part. So, um, 
<laughs> Disagree on some of that. <laughs> I literally had to file a congressional complaint just to get our soldiers paid because DTS was so far behind on paying people that they owed every single one of our team members $10,000 a piece. Wow. <laughs> it's a good thing they had you there because probably nobody else would have thought about doing it. It, was, it took a lot of phone calls and a lot of arguing yeah. <laughs> and a lot of going up the chain. Yeah, I can imagine. All right. Um, what's the favorite thing that comes to your mind when you think about your retirement or being retired? I am going to be so happy not to have a security clearance and not have somebody looking over my shoulder. Really? That's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting answer. I would have never guessed that. Um, I learned after working with, uh, different government positions, I was, I didn't like working in basements, didn't like not having access to my stuff, didn't like no windows and whatnot. And first job outside of, uh, even, uh, civilian government work where my office was looking onto the bay, I just realized I'm never going to do that again. I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. I don't want to go through all this scary stuff. And nice to actually smoke some weed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. If that's your thing. Um, not, not normally. I hadn't done it. I was like, you know what? I just want to relax. I don't yeah. this crap anymore. No, that's so, really interesting, though, because, I mean, I know we both know. Uh, we both work in pretty much the same field for a while. And, um, a lot of people get in that field and then they just get like, that's their thing. Uh, especially the MI folks. Right. But, um, yeah, that's interesting to, to want to get out of that kind of environment. Cause yeah, that's pretty was, much where you'd be stuck. Right. Yeah. I mean, I literally had, I think one, one place I worked at, I had to go through like seven different locked doors to get to my office. And one of them was a bank vault door and that was in a basement and. I apparently missed an earthquake. I mean, it was, yeah. I would I'd walk out to go get some, you know, walk up to the area to get some lunch. And you're like, oh, it snowed. <laughs> Nobody told me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just after that, and then going to work on it, literally watching the waves crash, crash against my office. You're like, yeah, I'm never going back. Yeah. I don't want any of that crap anymore. No, that's amazing. That's good. Yeah. Still, the same style work, so. Right. I still get to do what I love to do. That's great. That's really good. Okay. I mean, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you think might be important or? Well, um, well as we said, kind of building that, uh, that, that, you know, camaraderie structure outside of, of the military helps. Uh, for example, I have a couple of the guys from the unit that actually work with me on my job. So that makes it easy. Mm-hmm. Do you guys set up a thing like once a month or once every couple of weeks to meet up and do things? Or how do you, how do you structure that? Uh, yeah, we don't really structure. It's just, Hey, let's go do something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in the words of uh, Ty, it's like, we got to get the band back together. <laughs> That's me a message every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. All right, man, let's go find something. Yeah. But, uh, you know, actually working with them uh, at work helps. And we also have a couple other military people there too. So. Yeah, it was always a tight knit little organization up there. That's what I really, really liked about it a lot. Because I mean, I already I knew you and I knew a couple people, but once I actually got up there before, and I was like, "Wow, this is amazing!" And it's I was it's in different. that unit now for over twenty one years. Yeah. No, I st I started that I started in that unit in two thousand one, so I stayed in the same unit for twenty one years. Yeah. So that definitely feels a little weird. Yeah, I mean that's one of those those side effects of being a reservist, right? You can potentially get in a situation like that. And I mean, the field that you're in, it's a very small community, so like there's a handful of people in the in the world that do that work, you know. So, yeah, no, it's cool. Um, I love it because uh, I still get to bring the military aspect of things into to my civilian job, and uh, they get a little surprised with some of the stuff we can pull in there. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely uh it's definitely hard trying to to merge what your mindset is in the military and then convert that over to civilian life. Like I know I haven't been completely 100% active duty my whole career. 
Um, and, and it's just different, right? You go to a civilian organization, it's not so structured and it's not so rigid. Um, yeah, no, we, I, you know, I try and put some of the structure in there and at the same time try and pull some of that uh, structure away. But um, one thing that helped me throughout my career was once, you know, um, once I completed uh, warrant officer school, it felt like I was starting to get my civilian career, my military career and my education uh, online. And I think it was after um, my advanced course when all of a sudden everything just got you know, completely locked together. And that's when everything accelerated. And uh, I think started, that's when I really started to accelerate and everything and really enjoy what I was doing and find my niche, I guess. <laughs> Any parting words of wisdom or anything you would want to, if you could, if you could put a, a post out on LinkedIn and you knew for sure it was going to reach, say, 5 million people, um, what, what would it be and why? Anything. It could be a, a quote. It could be something that you want to put out into the world for people in general. Anything. I am. I try and look at all my IT guys um, and tell them, um, you know, this career is, uh, it's fast paced, it's moving, it changes. And, um, you know, specifically for IT and cyber, I always say, if, if, it's, if it's not a hobby, it's gonna run you over. So a lot of the times really make sure whatever you're doing for work is something you actually really enjoy doing, something that interests you. Um, it's like even, here nowadays, I get stuck in awful, awful meetings. And if I don't have to have the, the camera on uh, while the meeting's going on, I'll be going and remoting into random things and fixing things that nobody's even aware of. So I'll just be in the back end, just either working on my scripts just to make something run better or investigating something because, uh, you know, interests me. So it's the same thing. Just make sure that, you know, the age old cliche, what is it? Uh, uh, what is it? do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life or something along those lines. But, uh, you know, definitely if, you know, if, if whatever you're doing for work is not a passion, I never advise doing it because you'll hate it in the end. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that a lot, a lot actually. And I think that's why I'm kind of meandering down this path that I'm meandering down right now. Cause I realize <laughs> like, you always kind of meander. What are you talking about? Yeah, and and that's it's really amplified. It's like winning the lottery, winning the the uh, the freedom lottery. Like you you get it amplifies you know who you actually are. Uh, so yeah, getting out, retiring is really amplified my personality is of who I am, what I want to do, uh, what I feel about working for you know a company or working for myself or whatever. Like it's really it's really amplified my personality a ton. Um, oh, great. We need your personality. <laughs> More of this dude. Yeah. <laughs> cool, man. Um, that's all I have. This is a short one, actually. It feels like it was a short one. It wasn't too long. Um, I guess. Yeah, so maybe you have any other questions. I mean, whatever. <laughs> let, me look. let me look real quick. Let me see if I got some interesting, super interesting questions. Is it because that we've known each other for how many years? and How many schools together? And yeah, it kind of... It kind of uh, does that to you, yeah. So, well, that's not working. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Um, I've always loved just advertising the warrant officer career and position. I think it's one of the best things in the military and the amount of camaraderie that we were able to build between the warrant officers compared to others, I think is rather interesting. Um, like uh, randomly on the on the last, uh, last mission we were going to, um, they could not uh, easily provide us transportation to the mission. So we all had to drive down there individually. And um, well, I decided, to, I reached out to a couple of guys said, hey, let's drive in tandem just so we know where each other are, just in case there's an issue. And you know what? My car broke down. <laughs> Middle of the highway in, in Maryland, halfway halfway to mission. So, uh, you know, the Ward Officer Corps supports us and the old Ty is like, you're kidding, man. I'm like, nope, I'm on the side of the road. Car's not moving. So <laughs> Ty pulls up and we're all loaded with all of our gear to, uh, you know, be mobilized for, um, for a year. So we, you know, swapped around some gear as to what we both needed into his car and what we may not need left in my car. Got my car towed, 
we completed going to uh, the mission. Then um, another warrant officer uh, stepped up and um, was able to grab my car at Maryland and drive it back down to me. So, you know, uh, that got camar camaraderie just follows you around. And I've been able to help other people. And sometimes they've said, well, um, well, I can't pay you. I, said, <laughs> I don't remember asking for a goddamn cent. <laughs> right. <laughs> I said, just, uh, you know, somebody will ask for help later on. You know, try and take care of them if you can. If I have, since I had the ability to help somebody else, it didn't cost me to help them out. So, hey, let me help. Yeah, I've, I, uh, I definitely resonate with that. I mean, that was one of the, the first experiences as a warrant officer for me as well was, I mean, you helped me out. You took care of me and my family at the time. And you didn't Take have care to. Of me too. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, uh, you remember that was uh, during um, candidate school when I almost fell out because of the shin splints. Yeah. <laughs> and I've never fallen out of a ruck, but I that my shin splints are so bad that <laughs> you had to like crack them. <laughs> ah, you're like, this is gonna hurt. Like, ow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Some little but, things. Well, that's all we can do sometimes and those little things help more than you can imagine to some random person so yeah it's funny how the the ripple effects of stuff like that that you do that's why i, I generally generally tell people if nothing else like just be be friendly be kind like you know shit's gonna happen but <laughs> <laughs> you have drinking water like there's millions of people around the world who don't have drinking water so how bad could it possibly be uh, yeah, no, definitely learned that after my first deployment, came back and you're like, you know what? Life's not that bad. No. <laughs> it gets annoying to hear so many people complain about certain things. You're like, oh, there's been a lot worse. So, eh. yeah. Yeah, that's why I try to dial it in too when I'm asking some of these questions as well. It's like, you know, not just what happened and how it happened, but like how you felt about it, you know, what the what the emotional effects of it were, because I don't think we really, and you know me, I've been teaching the, the MRT stuff for quite some time as well too. So, um, I mean, my biggest struggles in the military sometimes were just a lot of the last minute notifications and some of those last minute notifications felt like it, you know, obviously we're in the army, we go to war and stuff, fully understand these things, but some of that stuff didn't feel like it needed to be last minute. And it was just so much bad planning on the other side. Um, I think I had uh, my orders to go to Iraq. I had about five days notice and over Christmas Eve, <laughs> and they literally like, oh, you're supposed to take care of all this stuff. You had five days. I'm like, this is, this is a holiday. Nothing's open. What am I supposed to take care of? Or uh, Sierra School literally getting uh, 48 hours notice to go to a school um, as a reservist to all of a sudden be a PCS move. And then everyone giving you crap down there. Gordon seemed to have this ability of, um, we've never seen a reservist before. I'm like, we've been coming here for years. So I'm not sure why every time we come in here, it's new for you guys. Yeah. So, the, you know, some of the last minute stuff definitely gets a little old. And, um, you know, even seeing that with the retirement, you're like, oh, hey, less than two weeks notice. Cool. I don't even have a drill in between them to turn in with the rest of my stuff or pass anything off. Yeah. So. If, if, there was a, miss <laughs> if there was anything you could go back and change, like if you, if you had the, the magic wand to change anything in the retirement process, what specifically would you go back and like address and give some attention to? Um, I think the only thing is I would pay probably a little bit more attention to the retirement date, but the, it was just, uh, I think it was kind of confusing and, Maybe doing, uh, I mean, I did that retirement um, class, could have paid a little bit more attention to that, but that was a couple of years ago. Um, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a person where even when I look back, I don't think I'd change anything because I don't think I'd ever change any mistakes that I've made in my life because they kind of put me on the path where I am now. Mm -hmm. Even the biggest, dumbest mistakes that I've made that have caused the most damage still have directed me into the great place that I am now. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I totally. made some big doozies, so. <laughs> well, I was actually, no, that's, that's great. And I, I like that you brought that up. That's uh, actually 
a really important point. Um, but I was thinking along the lines of like, if there was, if you could magically fix one of the processes, um, specifically, which one? <laughs> that paperwork process is just brutal. Yeah. Um, if it was in one document, that would kind of help. And it feels like you're just sending them the same details over and over again in a different form. Like, I know you have this information because I've given it to you. Why do you need it in another form? Yeah. Wait till you do the VA process. Uh, I've already got, well, what do you mean? All the paperwork that they require and the copies of everything and then. Uh, well, I've, so as reservists, we can uh, apply for VA benefits after uh, mobilization. So I've got all that stuff already taken care of. Oh, wow. So um, you can, huh. uh, apply. so that's what gets weird between the reservists and uh, active duty is like um, the DD-214s. I know the active duty hold that like that warm security blanket, but as a reservist, we have like 20 of them because we get it every time we complete something. Um, so as I said, our, our process is definitely different. And then you have to apply for the VA benefits after the MOB and you have a certain amount of time that's just supposed to do it. I wasn't aware of that. That's interesting. I don't think anybody ever mentioned that when we came back from mobilization, when I was reservist. Yeah, it, it wasn't mentioned to me except for, um, you know, Marcus pushed me into it. Mm -hmm. you know, Cause I. I was not a fan uh, for two reasons. Um, the first was when I did use VA um, for after my original deployment to Iraq, they said they were going to start putting all this information into my security clearance packet, which would jeopardize my job. So I stopped going to the VA. Um, after that, uh, they changed their policy. So that helped. But um, I kind of had that feeling of, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to abuse the VA or, or suck money out of there because I'm doing fine. And that money should go to somebody else. But, you know, other people convinced me that, I, no, that, that's to help you. And it was a little weird because I literally had one VA conversation, which was very uncomfortable, which they literally forced me to say I was asking for money. And I just, I was not a fan. I was like, you're, it just felt like they were forcing me to ask for a handout. Just, I don't know, verbalizing, it just made it odd. Yeah. And I, again, I haven't gone through the process yet. I started it and then I guess I missed the cutoff or something like that, but I'm definitely gonna, I'm hoping well, that it's a little bit better. <laughs> just a you know, reminder for anybody doing the VA stuff, you know, start that process, just even go to the website and check the box because uh, the process uh, from you checking that box is when they will pay uh, back pay you from. So if you apply for VA benefits or disability, the first day you check that box and say, I'm applying, that's the go live date that if it takes a year or more to complete, they're going to go all the way back to that date and back pay you from that date. Interesting. That's good to know. That's really good to know. Cause I don't think it's one of those things that you just don't understand unless you've actually gone through the process or you've seen somebody go through the process. <laughs> It's uh, that was a messy process too. So. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, I know you're not always on the socials and of course you don't have to worry about security clearances anymore or anything like that. So, um, but if, if somebody did want to reach out to you or find you, where would be the best place to find you or where would you point them to? I would point to my LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I use that more for the professional stuff and, uh, it's a little easier to get a hold of me as opposed to dumping all my, uh, uh, civilian contacts out there. Yeah. I already get blocked by enough spam. <laughs> I get blocked cool. by enough bots and I harass the spam bots back. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I'll go ahead and uh, throw that in the notes below. And uh, look, Glenn, it's it's a it's a real pleasure. I'm actually really glad we get to catch up again. I know it's an interview process, but uh, it's good to see you again. I'm glad you're still doing well. And I hope Gotta the wife's get your doing well. Yeah, I, I need to get back up to to Boston, some Boston, Boston. Boston. <laughs> Check see out the, the house, uh, all the fixes we finally did. See the get to see the new puppy. So yeah. we have a puppy. Like this. The the four hundred pound puppy. <laughs> it's definitely uh, not a pug. <laughs> uh, no, he's uh, everybody loves him. He's uh, it's it's a riot. Even the neighbors like. 
how is your dog so nice? I'm like, because I socialized him. Like, day one, I walked him out the door. I'm like, talk to every single person. So I was walking him almost like three miles a day, just taking random walks and just letting, like, hey, somebody want to pet my dog? Pet the dog. <laughs> and now when I'm walking, I talk to random people. He just lays down on the ground, rolls around. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, it's it's great when it's a shepherd. I, uh, I told the wife, you know, it's one thing to have a spoiled 20-pound uh, pug. If that thing gets mad, I just pick it up. But that's not going to work with the German Shepherd. So we got to, you know, train him and socialize him. Yeah. No, it's awesome. Yeah. I need to get back up there sometime. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, man. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, it was great talking to you in this format. And maybe we'll do it again. Who knows? I'm, I'm trying to do as many of these as I can. So uh, it helps. Hope it helps somebody. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll catch up with you later. And for everybody out there in the internets, uh, see you all later as well. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks.